My brave lad, he sleeps in his faded coat of blue. In a lonely grave alone lies the heart that beats so true. They will find him and know him amongst the good and true. When a robe of white is given for that faded coat of blue. No more the blue. Welcome to War of the Rebellion, Stories of the Civil War. I am your host, Leon Miazer, and this is a reading of the regimental history Under the Maltese Cross, Antietam to Appomattox, The Loyal Uprising in Western Pennsylvania, 1861-1865, Campaign's 155th Pennsylvania Regiment, narrated by the rank and file. And we're still in the middle of Chapter 5, and we are picking up right where we left off. Night Scenes on Battlefield It was a relief at dusk to find the regiment sheltered by the slope at the mill race, subject to no direct fire of the enemy except from occasional shells and frequent renewal of sharpshooting, when the men unnecessarily assumed a standing or even a sitting position exposing themselves. Quite late in the evening, it was discovered that the remainder of the brigade had left the battlefield to go to the town of Fredericksburg. No orders had been received by Colonel Allen, in command of the 155th and the 123rd Pennsylvania Volunteers, to leave the field, and they therefore assumed that they were ordered to remain. A heavy fog set in, and points became indistinguishable. The cries of the wounded with the calls of names of the various regiments to attract attention, could be heard at frequent intervals. An occasional stray shot still penetrated the fog and reached the lines. As the fog grew denser, volunteers were called for to ascertain where the regiments were, and also to bring in all of the wounded they could secure. Lieutenant Alexander Carson of Company D, with an occasional relief of men at great personal risk, brought in all wounded men found in the regiment's front, not ceasing until 120 wounded men had been rescued. Of those rescued was Color Corporal Chas F. Bardeen of Company F, who received a mortal wound, shattering his jaw. In the early morning, just before the fog lifted, several ambulances came along, which, had they not been halted, would have gone directly into the enemy's lines. Several were loaded up with the 155th wounded, whom they conveyed to the hospitals in the town of Fredericksburg, Corporal Bardeen being among them. Sad to state, although poor, Bardeen was tenderly helped into the ambulance, and a detail sent to accompany the wounded to the hospitals in the town of Fredericksburg. All of Colonel Allen's subsequent efforts to discover the location of the hospital, or even the lot of this brave fellow, were unavailing, and his fate will probably never be known. As stated, the two regiments left on the field under Colonel Allen were without orders. It was discovered late in the night that they were completely cut off from communication with any other parts of the Union Army. Major Pearson was sent to penetrate the fog and the mystery of what had become of the rest of the Army. The Major not reporting after an interval, Adjutant Montooth was dispatched on a similar errand, and he too could not find his way back. As both he and Pearson subsequently reported in describing their wanderings and endeavors to keep out of the Confederate lines, so dense was the fog that hours passed by and they could not find either their regiments or the town of Fredericksburg. Colonel Allen then left the field and, after much trouble, crossed the canal leading into the town, where he soon found General Humphrey's headquarters, it being explained there that the two regiments named had been entirely overlooked. Orders were immediately given to Colonel Allen that, as soon as the fog permitted, the two regiments named should march into town, which they did, joining the rest of the brigade in the streets of Fredericksburg. Street Scene in Fredericksburg The streets of the town where the troops of Humphrey's division were stationed, it was noticed, were full of loot and great scenes of vandalism and useless destruction of books, furniture, carpets, pianos, pictures, etc., were visible. 
This conduct was contrary to the orders of the commanding general, but the acts had been committed by non-combatants and camp followers. The army soldier, discharging his duty, has no time nor inclination for such disreputable work. Many buildings had been dreadfully shattered by the shell and shot, but this afforded no excuse for the wanton destruction of private property, or its unauthorized confiscation by men masquerading as soldiers in the uniform of blue. The sights and scenes during the bivouac of the troops in the streets of Fredericksburg were quite often amusing, even amid the gloom prevailing as a result of the great disastrous battle. Human nature, as studied, revealed all varieties of tastes and inclinations on the part of those troops who left the ranks to inspect the city. Some of those characters might be seen with musical instruments, with big horns, violins, accordions, and banjos confiscated from a deserted music store. Others rolled out barrels of flour and delivered them in their companies where, with the aid of water and fire and griddles, flapjacks were hastily baked and distributed among the companions. Drug stores gratified the tastes of others, who provided themselves with medicines and instruments to be found in such stores. The enterprising James Finnegan, a character of Company D, whose education abroad did not include either reading or writing, rifled the desk of an abandoned express office and found bundles of receipts, old notes, and canceled checks, which he gathered up with great care and concealed until its return to camp for examination. Being under the impression that it was a bank instead of an express company he was burglarizing, and that his captured booty would enable him and Lieutenant Carson whom he intended to let into the secret, to retire to Ireland, there to spend the remainder of their lives in opulence and luxurious living. It was during this sojourn on the streets of Fredericksburg that a detachment of the Union Signal Corps, which had climbed up and occupied the interior of the tall spire on the Episcopal Church of the city, attracted by the waving of signals, the attention of the battery commanders on Mary's Heights. These batteries in a few well-directed shots at the steeple, caused a panic in the signal corps, and the members of that body, their little flags, withdrew very precipitously from their elevated position. The 155th, which was stretched along the sidewalk or curbstone in front of this church, concurred most heartily in the rapid descent of the signalmen from the steeple. As the enemy shells directed that the steeple occasionally fell short and unpleasantly close to the regiment, enjoying a rest on the sidewalk. Also, whilst occupying this position on the streets, General Burnside and his entire staff and cavalry escort left the army headquarters on the north side of the Rappahannock and came over in person to the city of Fredericksburg. Halting at a public building not far from the position of the regiment's composing Humphreys Division, as General Burnside and his staff proceeded to dismount, the enemy's batteries, which had observed his conspicuous crossing on the pontoons and passing through the streets with his escort and flags, thought proper to direct a few shells at this cavalcade as it halted. The shots thus aimed came very nearly ending the earthly career of General Burnside, as a solid shot within a few feet of him killed one of his mounted orderlies. As soon as Burnside and his staff entered the house, the shelling of the enemy ceased, as they seemed to desire to avoid the destruction of the buildings. This fatal incident did not seem to disturb General Burnside or the members of his staff in the least as they entered the new headquarters. Most sorrowful and distressing were the sights and scenes in the hospitals in the town of Fredericksburg. The courthouse, market house, and every church and public building were literally crowded with amputating tables and beds on the floor containing the Union wounded, the death rate of whom was very great, necessitating the coffining and grave digging for many. Burnside proposes to renew the assault. It was currently believed and generally circulated that Burnside's visit to the town was to demonstrate his confidence in the ability of the men of his old corps to charge successfully and capture Mary's Heights by a direct attack although so many other assaulting columns had been repulsed. It was asserted, also, that he had declared his attention to prove this by leading in person the Ninth Army Corps in the assault, having organized and commanded that corps in battles, and he, therefore, 
proposed to stake all on this new and direct attack on Mary's Heights. This undeserved reflection on the efforts of all the other troops and their commanders, who had been repulsed on the most brilliant charges with heavy losses, was not received favorably by any of the commanders of divisions, corps, or grand divisions, and they so warned General Burnside, but he was irrevocably committed to the plan of leading a new storming column in person. It was known in advance of this campaign that all the generals of the Army of the Potomac, who had fought under General McClellan in his campaigns and who had become so personally attached to him, would be closely scrutinized in the battle in which his successor commanded. And with this notice, it can be said that Sumner, Hooker, Couch, Franklin, Hancock, Humphreys, Sykes, Griffin, and General Meagher, commander of the Irish Brigade, and all officers under McClellan, never fought better or cooperated more zealously with any other commander than they did in the ill-fated and disastrous battle under Burnside at Fredericksburg. President Lincoln, on receiving word of Burnside's determination to renew the direct assault upon Mary's Heights, intervened, and from an intimation from him to Burnside, the latter abandoned his intention, and the arrangements were accordingly changed, so that the entire army at nightfall was to fall back and retreat to the north side of the Rappahannock, there to occupy their old camps. It was fortunate, however, that word of General Burnside's intention to resume the attack on the next morning by leading the Ninth Corps in person reached General Lee through the capture by the Confederates of a staff officer conveying such information to General Franklin, commanding the left wing of the Union Army, at the lower crossing of the Rappahannock. This message, thus captured, was the cause of preventing orders to General Stonewall Jackson's command and other Confederate troops for a night assault on Burnside's army camped on the streets of Fredericksburg. General Lee, in answer to critics after the battle, censuring him for not attacking the Union army and preventing its retreat to the north of the Rappahannock, is said to have asserted his belief in the truth of this captured message conveying the word of the renewal of the assault on Mary's Heights by Burnside in person. Lee, therefore, averred in answer to critics that his works and positions were impregnable, and that he had decided to postpone the attack on the Federals in Fredericksburg until after the expected attack of Burnside's assaulting column on the following morning. Night Retreat of the Union Army the retreat of the Union Army under Burnside from Fredericksburg was conducted with great skill and success, considering the number of men and the shortness of notice. It was to prevent the noise of the large bodies of marching columns from attracting the attention of the enemy that the men in the ranks were ordered to remove their bayonet scabbards from the same side of the person on which the canteens and tin cups hung, which ordinarily made a noise in rapid marching not unlike the proverbial cowbells. Even talking in the ranks above, a whisper was prohibited because of the retreat and the necessity of its being conducted quietly and rapidly. This necessity being communicated to the men, they knew its significance and readily reciprocated with the officers in obeying the orders. The night was dark and rendered so by the heavy fog, and brigades and divisions were soon in line, and a constant procession the entire night occupied the pontoon bridges from the center of Fredericksburg to the north side of the Rappahannock. Ammunition trains and ambulances conveying the wounded men necessarily occupied one of the bridges, while the other bridge was used by the troops, so that towards morning the whole town was evacuated by the Union Army. Singular to state, Humphrey's division, the last to cross on the pontoons to serve as the forlorn hope, in the last charge against Mary's Heights, had the honor in turn of being the last to recross the north side on the pontoons, and was assigned the distinguished honor of covering the retreat of Burnside's army. Among the remarkable incidents occurring on the night of the retreat was the overlooking of many of the pickets. Owing to the confusion incident to the retreat, no orders were given for the retiring of the Union pickets and guards who were on their posts. As a result, quite a number, accidentally discovering the retreat of the main army and being without orders, left their posts and reported at the riverbank just in time to witness 
the last pontoon being taken up, leaving them on the south shore of the Rappahannock. Fortunately, the continuing fog, sleet, and rain thoroughly concealed the entire movements of the Union army from the enemy, and time was given guards and pickets to waken up and call in from the posts nearby other pickets and guards, and those who were off guard taking rest. These men, too late to cross on the pontoons to avoid being captured and gathered on the bank, and determined, cool as the weather was, that they had no resort but to swim the stream, and abandoning guns, equipment, and knapsacks, plunged into the river and swam across. Among many others thus abandoned, Corporal Frank Gilmore of Company A of the 155th, one of the guards at the courthouse in Fredericksburg, used as a hospital, swam the stream. Confederate Wine Confiscated A cheerful incident attending the evacuation of Fredericksburg occurred concerning Colonel Allen, General Humphreys, and many of the 155th Regiment, and as the sequel shows, a few uninvited comrades of a neighboring regiment bivouacked on the streets of the town, some in inquisitive spirits. Members of the regiment found a cellar full of other spirits close by, and upon reporting the discovery early in the afternoon, Colonel Allen sanctioned, for the sake of the sick and wounded in the hospitals, the appropriation of the contents of this wine cellar by a reliable committee from the regiment. The bottles were handed up one at a time through a vault hole in the sidewalk, and passed along in quantities aggregating over 400 bottles. When the work of the receiving comrades at the top of the grating required a rest, at this point a comrade, who later became famous in western Pennsylvania, being none other than the late William R. Jones, late manager of the Carnegie Steelworks at Braddock, but at that time serving as a private soldier in the 133rd Pennsylvania Regiment from Johnstown, Pennsylvania, volunteered to relieve the overworked men of the 155th in the labors of receiving bottles of wine passed up to them through the grating in the street. Private Jones kindly relieved the labors of the 155th men, but soon diverted a goodly number of the last hundred bottles to himself and companions for services rendered. This diversion was not discovered by the 155th until the next day, when through Colonel F. B. Speakman, commanding the 133rd. Jones's good joke on the 155th leaked out, and Colonel Allen thought the confiscation of the wine justifiable in view of the arduous duties of the troops and the inclement weather, and that rations of the superb wine should be distributed to his regiment. The colonel also sent a bountiful supply of the wine to the sick and wounded in the hospitals. General Humphreys Samples the Wine Orders had been issued by General Humphreys against the troops interfering with private property of any kind, and in the interest of discipline the direct penalties were threatened to officers tolerating any violation of these orders. It was, therefore, not without considerable curiosity as to how General Humphreys, the division commander, might, if invited by Colonel Allen to share the colonel's ration, take the tender of a little of this confiscated wine. Without any misgivings, however, Colonel Allen did induce General Humphreys to share his hospitality, although it was distributed once or twice by an occasional shell or stray shot, striking the building where the modest banquet to Humphreys was being tendered. At the proper period of the feast, Colonel Allen produced from beneath the table a bottle of wine, and in politest terms, asked General Humphreys to share a bumper with him. The general, who at times could be as polite as any man in the world, proved it on this occasion by most courteously accepting the colonel's offer, and in the absence of silver goblets or fine-cut glassware, the plain army tin cup was utilized and filled with the tempting beverage. General Humphreys pronounced a warm eulogy upon it, and demanded to know how Colonel Allen was so fortunate as to secure a bottle. The latter explained to him that he had another bottle and could furnish him another cupful, which the general received with great gusto. When finding that General Humphreys would not likely be shocked with the truth, he explained that to prevent vandalism and the destruction of the wine, 
he had taken the contents of the entire cellar for his sick and wounded in the hospitals, which report met with the hearty and cordial approval of Humphreys as a wise and humane act instead of censure. When, however, Colonel Allen admitted that he had already distributed a hundred bottles of this fine beverage to his own men bivouacking in the streets, Humphreys professed to be shocked beyond measure at the awful waste of such fine wine on such raw material as private soldiers. After some extenuating defense by Colonel Allen, and pleading specially the gallant charge of the 155th Regiment on Mary's Heights, Humphreys became reconciled to the wanton waste of fine spirit on private soldiers. And the colonel produced a third bottle from under the table, and another cupful, which the division general disposed of with great apparent relish. With the gift of a few more bottles to General Humphreys, he and Colonel Allen separated with a cemented friendship of a lasting character. The enemy did not discover the retreat of the main army until late in the day when the fog lifted, and great must have been their chagrin and disappointment over the masterly retreat of Burnside's army. The casualties on the Union side have never been fully or carefully tabulated but they are approximated to have reached not less than 17,000 men, mostly killed and wounded, a few being taken prisoners. As the distance from the north side end of the pontoons on which the army crossed to their old camps was very short, and as the winter huts of the camp were all intact, the same as they had been left a few days before, Burnside's army soon resumed their old positions and camps. About the only prominent general who took part in the battle at Fredericksburg that escaped official and personal denunciation by General Burnside was General Humphreys, whom Burnside, in his official report, recommended to be breveted Major General for conspicuous bravery and gallantry in leading the forlorn hope by his division on Mary's Heights. This recommendation Lincoln adopted, and General Humphreys was accordingly so honored. The charges preferred by General Burnside against 17 of his leading generals growing out of this Fredericksburg battle, when presented to President Lincoln, were met by the latter in his characteristic, homely, and common-sense way. He said to Burnside that, as between removing these other distinguished generals who had won distinction on many battlefields and removing him as the commander of the Army of the Potomac, it would occasion less trouble to the Union cause to remove him. The cabinet influences, however, that secured the appointment of Burnside, were able to overcome this opposition and to secure him another chance to redeem his lost reputation as a general. Burnside's Mud March Campaign, a Fiasco Accordingly, about the 20th day of January, 1863, Burnside organized another campaign against the Confederates, and prefaced the opening of the same with a remarkable address, and prefaced the opening of the same with a remarkable address that the auspicious moment had now arrived to strike the enemy a blow, which, in view of the sequel, was ridiculous. When the army broke camp to follow up or take advantage of the auspicious moment mentioned, the weather was fine and the roads very good for military movements but where the blow was to be struck was, of course, a profound secret to all but Burnside and his advisers. All that the men in the ranks knew was that the line of march was towards the upper fords of the Rappahannock, or possibly the fords of the Rapidan, where Hooker and Grant in later campaigns crossed to meet Lee's army. But fate seemed to be once more against Burnside, as at the end of the first half-day's march, a decided change in the magnificent weather took place by a storm of drizzling rain and snow, which in a few hours made the roads over which the heavy wagon and ammunition trains, and the troops had to march, impassable by reason of the muddy condition of the same. In many places the roads became almost liquid, and it was not unusual to see wagon trains, settler's wagons, and artillery wagons sunk to the hubs of the wheels, and the poor mules were unable to budge their loads it being as much as they could do in some cases to keep their bodies or heads above the water and mud. At first the troops, to meet this most unexpected change in the weather, were detailed by regiments with axes to chop down trees and build corduroy roads. 
but the storm continuing, this became impossible, and the roads could not be used. The pontoon trains, as well as the wagon trains, stuck in the mud, and the entire movement was completely blocked, more effectually, in fact, than it could have been by any human enemy. Unwilling to abandon this unfortunate movement, which had suddenly become so inauspicious, the command was given that the mules and teams in the pontoon trains stuck in the mud should be taken out, and in their places ropes should be tied to the wagons and regiments of men detailed, like firemen, to pull the ropes of the wagons conveying the pontoons. The storm continued, however, with unabated force, so that fires could not be lighted, rations cooked or shelter secured for the men, and at last Burnside was most reluctantly compelled to abandon the movement, which had promised so well. The enemy got word of the movement promptly, from some source, and as the troops came near the streams where their pontoons were to be laid, in derision, hoisted signs with the inscription, Burnside stuck in the mud. After three or four days of this miserable experience, the troops were marched back again to their old camps, and soon after Burnside's resignation was accepted, and General Joseph Hooker was named by President Lincoln to be his successor as commander of the Army of the Potomac. When the day's march was over, the bivouac spread. The sky our canopy, the earth our bed. How close along the shadowy hill arrayed mingled the campfires of our brigade. Or, when through travel or in battle spent, with what fraternal love each regiment shared with their comrades in their scanty store and with kind offices each other's burdens bore. We will end this episode right here at the end of chapter five and take up chapter six next week. I thought I was going to be able to bring some descriptions or new stories to the Battle of Fredericksburg and the Mud March. Talked about in this book, but I think the regimental history continues to provide that for us in its storytelling. When I think about when the soldiers are talking about going out and trying to find as many wounded comrades as possible, I'm not sure if I could do a better job than that in the way that they've already written it. Let's talk about two men here. I've got Colonel Allen plying his commanding officer with booze while the occasional cannonball lands around them. It's absurdity of it all. Like, excuse me, sir, would you like some wine? I brought like ten bottles. <laughs> you know then, and then like a cannonball crashes through the roof or something. Like, that's something you would see in Bugs Bunny, but this is here. I want to, and the reason I want to bring this is like specific, these kinds of people who are getting together. I wanted to like profile at least, or at least maybe start profiling individuals as we come across them in the book. So I put up a post about Colonel Edward J. Allen, and it's got his Wikipedia link, then a bunch of first-hand accounts that he wrote during his time in the Pacific Northwest, but in the 1850s, and uh, of his later years, and a poem that he did called The Veteran, which is my favorite. That one sent shivers down my spine. The soldier, who later becomes famous in Pennsylvania, and having a starring role in that incredible and hilarious theft of alcohol while in the army. Well, I looked him up, and he is indeed pretty famous. I suppose as much as one can be from the time period. But he is now known as Captain William Richard Jones, and we meet him as an enlisted soldier in our book, but he has quite the history, and I've included a fantastic write-up that Dale Wint wrote, up as a historian over at the uh, hopkinthomasproject.com. So if you go to my website or you go to his website, you'll be able to, uh, mine will just redirect you to his, but you'll be able to click on it. And it's pretty good. That's just nice to know. Like It's like all of his accomplishments, and you're like, mm, yes, but I know what you really did. Uh, I'm also going to start uploading uh, paintings and drawings and sketches and photographs and character profiles. 
they won't be too in depth because that's not something that I have like afforded time for, but um, it'll at least be something that every time there's a episode, you'll be able to go to the website and there'll be something for you to read or uh, to look up, to engage with. We'll also make sure that we're following the regiment. So you guys know where they're at at each time. I'll put up maps. I've been kind of lax about that lately, but a lot of it's also going to be from the library of Congress. So you'll be able to check it out for yourself if you want. All right, my friends, thank you for listening. Uh, don't forget to leave a comment or like or subscribe or drop a rating, whatever platform you're using to listen to my show. Uh, it just really helps out and it can help my show get more exposure. So with that, my friends, I bid unto you a fantastic new year.